Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show, bringing you another really fascinating guest today involved in creating a better tomorrow on so many unique fronts. Uh, today, we have the honor of being joined by Monica Medina, who is the Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of Oceans and International Environmental and Scientific Affairs at the United States Department of State. Uh, she was also uh, recently appointed with extra responsibilities as the United States Special Envoy uh, for Biodiversity and Water Resources. Uh, previously, Secretary Medina was an adjunct professor at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service, a senior associate on the Stephenson Ocean Security Project at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and co-founder and publisher of Our Daily Planet, a newsletter on conservation and the environment. Uh, a former principal deputy uh, undersecretary of uh, commerce uh, for oceans and the atmosphere, Secretary Medina served as the general counsel uh, at NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and special assistant to Secretary of Defense. Uh, earlier in her career, uh, Secretary Medina served as the senior counsel to uh, former Senator Max Baucus on the Senator uh, Environment and Public Works Committee as the Senior Director for Ocean Policy at uh, National Geographic Society, as the Ocean Lead at the Walton Family Foundation, and in senior roles in various other environmental organizations. Uh, Secretary Medina attended college uh, on an Army ROTC scholarship. She began her career on active duty uh, in the Army General Counsel's Office, received the Department of Defense's Medal for Distinguished Public Service and the Army's uh, Meritorious Service Medal. Uh, and she has a bachelor's degree uh, in history from Georgetown University, a law degree from Columbia Law School, and we're honored to have her with us today. Uh, so, Secretary Monica Medina, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. Thank you, Ira. That is such a nice introduction, a full, uh, a full sweep of my career. <laughs> it's it's been an amazing journey so far. Um, you know, I, I would love to hear just a little bit about. Uh, what first stimulated uh, this advocacy, though, for, you know, the wide range of conservation causes that uh, now, you know, fall within your purview today? It's interesting, because if you told me when I was in high school, this would be where I ended up, I would have said, really? I wouldn't have guessed it. Um, I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, I loved going to the ocean. You know, I loved being outdoors. I was a Girl Scout. I went to camp and camped out and everything. But we were not you know, a particularly um, uh, action-packed, adventurous family. We did what everybody did. We went to the beach, you know, we um, we fished off a pier, you know, we, we did uh, really fun things in the environment. And I think, you know, that shaped me more than I probably um, appreciated at the time. My mom also was a school teacher and she loved um, animals and she had a whole curriculum based on uh, bringing her students to the Atlanta Zoo and having them observe animals and take scientific, uh, make scientific reports about their observations. So that made a big impression on me too. Um, but really, I, I just wanted to work in government uh, from a very early age. The best uh, I can remember, I wanted to be a lawyer and I wanted to work in government. And to do that, I joined the army because uh, that was the best way to to get the best education I could coming from a public high school. And my both my parents were teachers, so we really couldn't afford college. So for me, the best thing to do was to join the army. And that led me to, um, to a job working on uh, the law, law side of the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, 
agency, a government agency that not many people have really heard of, unless you live near a beach where they've replenished the beach, or you live near the Mississippi River or one of the other river systems that they manage and operate. Uh, and then you know a lot about the Corps of Engineers. Um, but for most Americans, it's it's not a very well-known agency, but they do manage all wetlands in this country. They manage river systems. They um, keep harbors uh, dredged so that ships can get in and out safely. They have a huge environmental um, um, scope of work. And that gave me a taste of uh, what this work would be like. And and I just, you know, kept building from there. So uh, it's been a fascinating journey from, you know, the Army Corps of Engineers and their river systems and um, and all of that, all the way through now to working globally on these giant global challenges like um, climate change, of course, but nature and biodiversity loss and plastic pollution. So, you know, the 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 span has been a really interesting one. And I've been in and out of the government. I've done um, jobs in the corporate world and in the NGO world. I've taught. So I've really had a chance to do a variety of different things in my career, but always thinking about it thinking about the work as an advocate, as a lawyer, thinking about uh, about advocating for um, conservation causes. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's funny, when we go to the beach now with my family, my kids always say, uh, oh, mom's gone to visit the clients. You know, <laughs> so, so um, although I'm not a scientist, I've gotten to work in science agencies. We now, in my the bureau I work for at the State Department, um, are part of our our um, work is to actually represent scientists um, and bring science diplomacy um, yeah. everywhere around the world to try and build bridges with other countries by working scientists to scientists in peer-to-peer -peer collaboration. And um, and I was uh, reminded yesterday, actually, that um, the first diplomat for the U.S. was Benjamin Franklin. And of course, he was one of our most famous scientists. So. Yeah. Science and diplomacy have been together um, uh, here at the State Department since its very beginnings. Outstanding. And, and I, I live right now uh, around the corner from where Ben Franklin's house used to be. Oh, wow. So I used to head over to that museum all the time and see all the stuff that he invented, including the uh, the flippers, uh, the scuba <laughs> flippers. So uh, I always thought that was a side, a little side note there. But anyway, getting back to you, um, you know, w when we, we think of our United States Department of State, um, you know, the things that obviously come to mind are our embassies and the consulate and the, the ambassador, of course. Um, your purview is is much broader. Um, you have responsibility uh, for the ocean and its biodiversity. You have responsibility for terrestrial biosphere. Uh, I, I looked in the uh, the annual report and you have some responsibility for sort of space sustainability now. Introduce us a little bit, if you would, to the department's Bureau of Oceans, International Environmental and Scientific Affairs. And if, if you could loop back into that, as you were just mentioning, because, you know, one of the uh, previous guests we had on the show was Ambassador John Lang, uh, who introduced us to, to science diplomacy from the pandemic side of things. Talk a little bit about what science diplomacy means from an environmental conservation perspective. Well, you know, as I mentioned before, these problems that we're dealing with today, the pandemic or climate change or plastic pollution, they're global. No one country can solve them on their own. Of course, we have to solve them uh, at, at the national scale because that's where the laws are. You know, that's where we, even the national or even subnational levels, but we, we can't solve them individually. Uh, so that's why the work that we do is so important. The secretary has, Secretary of State Antony Blinken has talked about the challenge today being able to govern the global commons in ways that make the world safer, more secure, and more prosperous and beneficial for everyone. And it even expend, extends into space. So this bureau is really intended to do to look at all things related to Earth systems and their health. And in fact, we even, at least for a time now, have been the bureau that covers global health in the State Department. So we've worked on health security issues from Ebola to monkeypox to obviously the COVID-19 pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and we 
in fact, look at them holistically from a one health approach, thinking about how if we conserve biodiversity and the landscapes um, where wildlife live, not only will we help ourselves by not um, having the extinction, you know, we'll, we'll fight the extinction crisis that we're in, but we'll also help for climate went by storing carbon in, in intact ecosystems and will help solve the pandemic crisis by preventing that zoonotic spillover that could have caused the COVID-19 pandemic. So, you know, for us, the work um, is what we call in the State Department a functional bureau. We're divided into geographic regions. People in the State Department work very closely, as you mentioned, with embassies and countries and understand the issues from a country by country and regional perspective. And then there are functional bureaus like mine that cut across and deal with a certain set of issues. And mine are all the ones having to do with the earth. And uh, for for our listeners, and there's a um, sort of the annual report of which, you know, you have the commentary in there. It's entitled uh, A Pivotal Year for Health and the Planet and Its People. It just came out uh, December 29, 2022. And I recommend everyone listening and watching to go take a look at that. But I thought it'd be interesting, as you were saying, to drill down on, on some of the topics in there, uh, because you had, you've had a very active year, as you were just mentioning, um, you know, uh, you, I guess we could start off with sort of COP27 um, and, and you know, you attended several of the sessions there. One of them, as you were just saying, it was entitled A Strong Medicine, U.S. Progress in Enhancing Health System Sustainability and Resiliency. And here you talk about sort of the, as you were just saying, the zoonotic spillover and the One Health. Uh, another session that you wrote about was the ocean-based climate solutions. And this, um, I thought, fit nicely as well into because you were also at our ocean conference 2022 yes. uh, we had president whips on the show and you know you were there with you know, president biden and president obama and, and secretary kerry talk a little bit about sort of the theme there and how it sort of fits in because of the sort of the cop 22 and our oceans conference all came back to this 30 by 30 sort of how we can try and restore 30 percent of of the oceans uh in the next 10 years take us a little into that uh set of programs if you would you know, as I mentioned at, at, in that previous answer, these things are not distinct issues right. at all. You know, if we save biodiversity, we can also help restore store climate and we can prevent pandemic spillover. So all these conferences last year really were very mutually reinforcing and beneficial, whether it was the Our Ocean Conference or um, France held a One Ocean Summit. Yep. Uh, the UN had an ocean co um, uh, conference as well last year. So we had several of those. And, and right now um, we're working towards a new global agreement that would create the law out in the high seas beyond areas where nations have jurisdiction. So we're trying to create a new agreement that would allow us to actually protect places in the high seas from fishing or other extractive activities just so that we can conserve them like we conserve parks here in the U.S. Yep. There's no way to do that on the out on the high seas. And it plays into this notion that oceans are really important and their health is really important to keep the climate in balance. And um, and we need uh, you know to make sure that we don't fish all the fish out of the ocean because we need them for food. So to keep the ocean ecosystem going, we need to conserve what um, scientists say is at least 30% of it. And that's why this agreement is so important and it fits well with another meeting that we just concluded, another global effort at conserving 30% of the entire planet by 2030. So that's that 30 by 30 um, effort that you mentioned. So all of these uh, meetings, whether it's a conference based uh, or focused strictly on the oceans or one that's focused on climate or one that's focused on biodiversity, they're all aiming to conserve more in order to keep the system, our planet, um, our planet's health intact, because the more we destroy, the harder it is to sustain life on the planet. And I, I don't mean to make that sound quite so um, so scary. But at one level, it really is. Once the system breaks down completely, we have a really hard time sustaining life on Earth. And that's what all these efforts are aiming at. And uh, a part of 
you know, keeping the oceans healthy is, uh, you know, aside from um, limiting what we extract from it, uh, is limiting the amount of the damn junk that we put into it. Yes, um, absolutely. You, you know, wrote a piece uh, that the uh, high level roundtable on financing plastic circularity, uh, Stockholm plus 50, uh, and, and you wrote this piece, Need for Transformative Change. Um, and just to drill down, we got to keep these eight to 12 million metric tons, million metric tons of plastic, plastic. from reaching the ocean bear. Um, and this, you know, there's a 2040 uh, goal here. Uh, yeah. Say a few words about this, if you would. So we have so many of these undertakings happening at the same time. This is kind of an explosion of new environmental activism around the world, appreciating, again, as I said, that these plant these problems are global in nature. So then another one that we're working on, we're in the midst of negotiating, we're just starting the negotiation of an agreement on how to end plastic pollution by 2040. And the public really got behind this agreement because of all those campaigns that probably your your listeners have heard about where, you know, banning plastic straws or those clamshell uh, in cases that you put, you know, takeaway food in because too much plastic was ending up in the ocean. And so we saw the impact of it just really in a visceral way when a whale would wash up on a beach dead somewhere and they'd open it up and find that its entire belly was full of plastic pollution or a, there were iconic pictures really just devastatingly sad pictures of marine life turtles with straws stuck through them or birds that were also kind of um were killed because they ingested way too much plastic and you know more and more research is showing that plastic is permeated every aspect of our planet. And that's um, really, I think, got people very worried as well. So we are trying, again, as a, as a global community, every country on the planet agreed last February that we need an agreement to help curb plastic pollution. And we can't do it just sort of by sticking a, a net at the end of river systems and holding the plastic in, you know, into nation, national boundaries. We have to start with why do we have so much plastic in the first place? Do we need all the plastic that we have? Can we make a more circular economy where plastic gets used again and again and again? So it's the it's it's a an incredible substance, right? It's so durable and it's so flexible. It can be used for so many things, but it doesn't biodegrade. It doesn't break down. It doesn't, you know, turn back into the carbon that made it. So once we have a piece of plastic, it's with us for, you know, hundreds of years. So this agreement is an effort to sort of figure out how to reduce the amount of plastic we make in the first place, reuse more plastic. Why not use something 50 times if it can be used 50 times? Because the material is that durable. And then once we're done with it, can we recycle it so we don't have to go dig hydrocarbons out of the ground and make more plastic? Can we can we use the plastic we have again and again and again and then recycle it and use it again and again and again? It's going to take a lot to do that because our economy over the last 50 years has become increasingly dependent. A lot of uh, consumer goods come in plastic containers. We ship food in a way to keep it safe from contamination, but we wrap it in plastic and then we throw that in a in a you know in a a landfill and it ends up in our environment in a way that hurts us again. So we're we're we may be solving one problem, but we're causing another one. So we need to rethink the way uh, we we package an awful lot of things and we deliver them to, to consumers. And we think it's entirely possible to have a lot less plastic um, and not lose the convenience and the, and, and frankly, some of the beneficial parts of, uh, or uses for plastic. Um, so we just have to get more creative. And fortunately for us, uh, the industry, um, you know, agree. So companies like Coca-Cola and Pepsi and um, Unilever and Mars also want to help us solve this problem. And um, that's great. But, you know, we, you know, we, we, we need to really get after it. And so that's why we set that ambitious goal of 2040 by eliminating to eliminate plastic pollution, not all plastic, but plastic pollution by 2040, because we think um, that we need to set that kind of a goal, given the amount of 
new virgin plastic that's being made and how the numbers of the amount of plastic being made for the first time is going up and up and up and the amount we're recycling is going down and down and down so we need to reverse those trends oh yeah definitely um coming from sort of the global perspective just a little closer uh to home can you say a few words about i read you know you um you gave testimony before the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis and specifically focus on this theme of the Eastern Tropical Marine Corridor, which is rather close to us. Could you say a few words of what's happening there with some of our uh, partners in places like Costa Rica and Colombia and yes. what have you? It's very exciting. Um, we have been working for a long time, as I said, to try and create marine protected areas in the ocean. We do it now inside countries' jurisdictions. And what Costa Rica Panama, Ecuador, and Colombia did was decide that they were going to take their marine protected areas inside their coast, inside their jurisdiction, and try to manage them as one instead of having them be a series of independent one, you know, one off parks. They recognized that a lot of the marine environment is connected through the way the ocean circulates and the marine wildlife. Um, uh, migrates, and those areas actually don't function independently in the in the ocean as an as an ecosystem. They're related to one another, and so their idea and their presidents got together at COP26 in Glasgow and signed an agreement that said we are going to work together to make these marine protected areas even more effective by managing them in concert with one another instead of just doing our own each of us doing our own thing that was a real breakthrough and we hope that more countries will look to do the same thing will look to look at the marine environment not as just theirs inside their domestic jurisdiction but as a part of a bigger ecosystem um, that if managed more um uh, cooperatively could provide even more benefits for all of the people involved. So, you know, these things are wonderful because they're good for nature, but they're also good for people. And that's the part of this story that I hope your listeners will take away is that for all the wonderful think reasons to conserve nature because it's beautiful, because it inspires us, because it's wondrous. Um, really it's, because it sustains us. Our economies are whole, wholly owned subsidiaries of a, of a clean environment, of a healthy environment, of an environment that's got resources, natural resources that we replenish and we think about using sustainably and not destroying. So I, I often um, try to emphasize that the reason we do this work is because it makes us better off. It, mm -hmm. it reduces conflict between um, countries or between communities because it provides a more lasting economic benefit, not one that we just get today, but one that our children and our children's children will get to enjoy. If we're smart, this planet will be able to sustain us if we use it well, if we, if we think about our footprint, our imprint on those ecosystems, on that natural system, then we will be able to live the same way we are now for for generations. But we have to think about it. If we just use things, we don't really think about the impact we're having on the planet. Future generations of our children and grandchildren will will be paying the price. You know, it's really interesting because you know, as you were you know talking about. Um, the history here, let's say, of, of of how we have used the planet in the past. Um, I, I found it extremely exciting and interesting that within the, the 2022 report, uh, which is going to the section on um, science diplomacy and science envoys, uh, one of the ones that stood out to me was uh, you mentioned the nexus of environmental science and indigenous knowledge. And I th found this completely fascinating because I had uh, a member of this was a couple of years ago, a member of the uh, the Warani peoples uh, from Ecuador who won this amazing lawsuit again. I think it was Occidental Petroleum or something, been mm -hmm. preserving the, the Ecuadorian Amazon. But 
she was telling me all this really cool stuff about, you know, uh, if certain birds don't make certain sounds, you don't harvest these plants over. Uh, I mean, they over had there, a really right. in-depth understanding of the system as an, indi- and, and when you look at the number 350 million or so indigenous peoples still live on this planet in these ecosystems, talk a little bit about this, as you said, this nexus uh, that you're going to be exploring between uh, these two systems. I think it's so fascinating how much, knowledge we really haven't tapped into yet because it's it's kept by these indigenous communities and we really haven't um seen it uh um explored or discussed nearly as much as we need to uh, they have been stewards of the natural resources that they've depended on for thousands of years and they have this wonderful wealth of of um, knowledge that it may not be associated with PhDs and science papers and published literature, but they too have um, tested it, peer reviewed it over time in just different ways. And I'm very excited about how much we are reaching out to indigenous communities to learn from them and to see what we can use of what they know. Uh, And we have, um, you mentioned a group of science envoys. They're um, experts from academia and large uh, research institutions who we um, recruit to come and help us uh, spread U.S. science and diplomacy together all around the world. And we just selected the newest group. um, And there's seven uh, wonderful scientists from all over the country who have expertise in particular areas that we are really interested in, from quantum computing to marine protected areas like that one in the eastern tropical Pacific. And we this year selected one PhD scientist from the University of Michigan who happens to be an indigenous uh, man who his whole um, background and his whole all his research is about indigenous knowledge and the use of indigenous knowledge and bringing that into the you know, to the, to our, what we think of as the scientific community. And I'm so excited about that because I think that message will resonate all over the world. And we can not only share our indigenous knowledge, and we have a wealth of it in this country, but we can also gather a lot of indigenous knowledge and learn from other parts of the world, like Colombia or the, you know, other Amazon countries or the Arctic, um, Oh, yeah. or the Pacific Islands who understand reefs and reef systems so well. Um, so I think we have just scratched the surface of what we could know. And we need all of this knowledge in order to deal with these challenges. So um, I'm counting on our new envoy, but also all our efforts inside the Biden administration to reach out and work with indigenous communities and and to hear them, to bring them to the table, because they have... Um, not only a wealth of knowledge, but they're also some of the best stewards and the land that they manage and control um, is some of the best conserved on the planet. So yeah. <laughs> we need it and we need them and we need to learn from them. Absolutely. Yeah, that's why I'm so excited to see that. Right, you know, it's in there right next to the quantum computing. I was like, wow, this <laughs> this yeah. is an interesting contrast. But no, that, that was fascinating. I, I appreciate you sharing that uh, with us. Um, so, you know, we talked about the oceans, we talked about the terrestrial biosphere. Let's, let's talk a little bit about space, because uh, I noticed earlier in the year, uh, you were at the uh, the National Space Council, uh, meaning at the Johnson Space Center, and you, uh, you know, gave a report here. And as part of, you know, our plans to go back to the moon and beyond, uh, you mentioned we still, as spacefaring nations, need practical principles, safe, transparent, and responsible behavior uh, up in space. And um, a couple of months ago, I had uh, the space environmentalist, Mora Bajal, on the show, and he pointed out that, you know, just like all this plastic that we're putting in the ocean, there's a lot of junk floating around up there right now. Um, talk a little bit about sort of your responsibilities and, and what you think about as you think about these outer space treaties. It's very similar to the high seas and the ocean. You know, you think, oh, gosh, what could be more earthly than the blue of the blue planet? But really out the blue out in the atmosphere is a similar place um, where we don't we have a, a treaty, a global treaty on the peaceful use of space. But we've just got the most bare bones rules there. And um, we do have, uh, you know, agreements about how to put satellites into orbit, but trying to enforce them and to keep everyone 
really doing the right thing by everyone else is challenging. And there is a lot of debris. Satellites, um, you know, go, they wear out and then they break down. And um, actually our defense department is tracking all of the debris in space over a certain size because right. it could threaten other satellites and yeah. our space missions and the like. So we have to now think about even space and beyond outer space as um, as something that we need to take care of and we need to work cooperatively if we want to all achieve the maximum benefits and, and can sustain it for future generations. So uh, we at the State Department are working in several ways to do that. We work, as you mentioned, on these um, on ensuring that we understand where this debris is and that we communicate well when we think there might be a collision of some sort. We avoid those things when it comes to satellites. And now when it comes to exploration and potentially the commercialization of space, the U.S. government is um, working hard to bring other countries with us as we go back to the moon and beyond in the Artemis um, in the Artemis program mm -hmm. that NASA runs. And one of the most exciting things that we work on is bringing more countries um, uh, into our Artemis program and make them full signatories. And, and that means they're willing to live by a certain set of rules that we are setting. So it's kind of like a voluntary agreement, a voluntary group of countries who see using space the same way for peace, for uh, continued um, prosperity and sustainability. So uh, we're, we're um, very excited to be uh, going back to the moon in the Artemis program. You may have read about the launch in November of an unmanned space uh, mm -hmm. rocket that tested our ability to get back to the moon. And in the years ahead, we'll be sending humans back to the moon. And uh, we hope that um, that we'll be bringing uh, astronauts from other countries with us who will go to the moon. And we hope that uh, the the next um, moon landing will be um, one in which uh, women and diverse uh, astronauts are also um, the ones who get to make that journey. So it's a very exciting program. And I think it is it, it, in, it exemplifies the best of what we get to do in the State Department, which is build bridges to other countries um, uh, with science and exploration and the kind of this mutual sense of peace and stability and um, sustainability and growth uh, going hand in hand. Excellent. Um, coming back to, you know, something I mentioned in, in, in your bio, um, you know, amongst every, everything you've been involved in, you founded uh, Algerly Planet. And, and I, I went to the, the site, sort of read your original mission statement here, you know, where you say, I wanted to bring news of the environment and conservation to people over the country in a way that was easy for them to take in. Uh, I believe the more people know about these issues and what's happening on the ground, the more they'll be empowered and inspired to do what they can to make a difference and to live sustainably. Um, I was wondering if you just say, a few words about the input you know, because I looked at your mission statement. I was like, that's kind of what I like to do with my show. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I want to get these cool people like you taught you know, out there that just I'm not interested in all this stuff going on in Hollywood or all this other right. nonsense. There's such a deluge of stuff out there. Talk about, you know, if you could just say a few words about founding of the Aldelli Planet. And, you know, is this something you, you know, you want to, because I mean, it, it's such a important resource. And, uh, you know, obviously, you got to get through a lot of clutter nowadays, um, with, mm -hmm. with the amount of material that we're all <laughs> uh, put in front of us. But but say a few words about this, because I think it's so important uh, sure. that these issues remain front and center with everybody. You're so nice to ask that question, because I still get people who tell me, I miss our daily plan, and I wish you would do it again. And I think, well, maybe maybe one day I will. Um, it was born out of the I, uh, out of my experience at National Geographic. It, it's interesting. I, I think you mentioned in your long recitation of my, or your recitation of my long career, um, that I had spent a little time at National Geographic. And yep. that's where I learned the importance of storytelling. People relate to good stories. And uh, I think, you know, National Geographic has two sort of secret sauces, storytelling and visuals. And, um, and at the time, uh, I was uh, working in um, a large philanthropic organization, the Walton Family Foundation, but I mm -hmm. felt like I needed 
to speak up for nature. Somebody needed to connect these dots between, you know, the straws uh, in in their, you know, soda pop, uh, washing up on beaches in, you know, far flung places where they hadn't put them in the ocean in the first place to, um, you know, the really extreme weather events that we were seeing happening more and more. What we really needed to do was connect the dots between um, why is this happening and why does it matter and what can I do about it as a person, both in my daily life and in the way I think about the people I vote for in elections or the the you know products I buy. Um, so we I, I found a partner who was feeling the same way. Like we needed, there was a lot of, uh, there were a lot of publications that followed the energy transition and, you know, thought about climate change from um, the change over from fossil fuels to renewable energy. Mm -hmm. But there was no one talking about biodiversity and um, kind of the natural systems and particularly thinking about how is climate really impacting people's daily lives. Uh, so we we thought, well, we could write something that's sort of like National Geographic meets any of those daily email newsletters that you see. There are a bunch of great ones out, out um, for people to read, whether it's uh, Axios or um, yep. uh, there's one, uh, gosh, um, uh, the Skim or, you know, there's a bunch of email newsletters and they were starting to really be in vogue. And people, I think more and more are getting their news, you know, right here on their phone, right? So um, our goal was to try to find the five really interesting environmental stories that were not on the front pages of newspapers or were not in the preeminent national newspapers and and bring them to people in short bursts with a lot of click through. So, you, you know, we linked to the original journalists. We were really trying to lift up great environmental journalists and great, you know, a podcast like yours. If there was a great podcast like the one you did not long ago with the chief uh, wildlife conservation officer from the San Diego Zoo, if there was mm -hmm. a great podcast like that that gave a, a much longer explanation, if somebody wanted to, they could click through in our story and go to that and hear more or learn more. So we tried to be very curated in the in the stories that we selected so that we balanced worry about the planet and what we saw happening and wonder with, you know, the discovery of a new species or a new cure for something. So we set out to just try to figure out if there was be would be an audience. And what we found was we had a really interesting audience of um, influencers. We, yep. you know, we started to uh, email friends and they emailed it to friends and eventually it, it ran, um, it, it got picked up by a lot of people on Capitol Hill and the re in the responsible committees of jurisdiction that did environmental law and um, companies, environmental sustainability officers started to read it. And so it, it took on a little life of its own. And it was really uh, quite an amazing experience because I was always shocked at how far it would reach. I'm sure you hear the same thing about your podcast, you know. You think, oh, I did I reach anybody? You know, you do, <laughs> and then later on, you hear how a story might have. I, I had yep. one funny story where a lady said, who I worked with, said, you know, somehow my mom got your newsletter because she lives in a sustainable community in Florida, and they found it and passed it on to people. So you just never know where um, where it might end up on the internet. Mm -hmm. It was mm -hmm. it was really a, a labor of love. We we tried hard to be visual um, and to, like I said, to have uh, links to everything. So people knew we weren't just making it up. We were fine. We were mixing yeah. and blending and curating stories so people could get as much or as little as they wanted. Mm -hmm. Very cool. What, um, you know, you, we, we were talking about the plastics before you mentioned, you know, if they're, and, and people are developing technology. But there's a way to take those millions of tons of plastic and and recirculate them and and turn them into fuel again. That would be awesome. Um, I, I saw an interesting story uh, a few weeks ago about uh, I forget where it was. Someone's working with this uh, this worm that likes to eat plastic. Yes. So looking. Um, what 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 gets you excited in terms of some of the new tools, whether they're ultra high tech or whether they're utilizing nature to solve some of these solutions. 
Well, I think the the that's really been a game changer over the course of my career is how much technology is shaping the future of conservation. Um, so when it's whether it's uh, finding um, what we call distant water fishing vessels that go way out into the high seas and turn off their um, their tra tracking devices and then go in and out of protected areas or mm. um, stay out at sea for long periods of time. But now we can increasingly see them and figure out when they've turned those things on and off and then try to track them and trace them. We aren't all the way there yet, but we have much more capacity to have eyes on a lot of parts of the planet that we we didn't used to. Um, I think the uh, amazing work being done on trying to better understand climate systems so that we can better forecast what's mm -hmm. happening with the climate so that we can at least do the best we can to prepare people for whether it will be a drought or um, uh, a particularly rough hurricane season um, so that we can do the best we can to get people and um, and their livelihoods and their lives out of harm's way. Um, it's it's uh, an amazing thing to see um, what scientists and innovators can do if we um, if we just tap into those resources. And uh, I hope that with say the plastic agreement that we were talking about before, that we build um, the capacity for uh, a tremendous dialogue that will happen side by side with the agreement. So we have a bunch of people who are negotiating words on paper, but I hope we also have a lot of scientists and innovators and business people who are getting together at the same time and thinking about how to solve the problem mm -hmm. rather than us trying to micromanage our way out of it. Let's innovate our way out of it. And uh, increasingly, you know, because the world is so connected by the internet, ideas, um, and uh, and exchange of information is easier than it ever has been. And, and it, it it really has changed completely the way we think about environmental um, issues because we can see them now in a way that we couldn't before F using satellites, using big data um, and analytics to really understand um, the the toll we're having on the environment and how to fix it. Uh, I am incredibly optimistic um, that we will be able to solve these challenges as long as we work at it, as and particularly as long as we, um, you know, uh, bring along young people who are who are thinking about them the the problems in different new and different ways. Um, you know, we spent a lot of last year celebrating 50 years of environmental progress. A lot of the major environmental laws in this country were passed around 1972. So last mm -hmm. year was a big 50th anniversary of Earth Day and um, and of uh, major environmental laws like the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act. And it, globally, it was the same. The, um, the big global environmental movement began in Stockholm in 1972 in UN, at a UN meeting where the countries of the world came together and said, gosh, we've got to start working on environmental issues. And that was sort of the dawn of the global environmental movement. And what I see today is a is sort of a, a renewal of that same sense of purpose and that global commitment to solving these big challenges. That's not to say that there aren't countries, and we can think of a few, that are not uh, helping us on that right now and who whose actions are being um, are destructive and and tearing away at the very um, fabric of global cooperation and peace and sust sustainability and stability and the Russian war of aggression in Ukraine, you know, is, stands, you know, high r right up there as, um, you know, a terrible problem that we're dealing with right now that's causing yeah. food shortages and um, environmental devastation in Ukraine uh, that um, is just uh, unimaginable and inhuman. But at the same time, we have tremendous cooperation around um, you know, solving some of these challenges, whether it's the climate cops, which are now enormous events where people come together and really try to find new and better ways to, to get our emissions under control and to keep that 1.5 degree um, increase in temperature within reach or this plastic agreement where hopefully we'll 
agree on ways to end plastic pollution by 2040 or um, or the this new agreement on 30 by 30 by thinking about conserving 30 percent of the planet by 2030 in order to ensure that we have the healthy ecosystems, the nature, bees and water and um you know, all the things that we need to keep ourselves sustained, um, that we that we protect enough nature that we can do that. I, I think we we had a, a you mentioned it at the beginning of the show, how busy a year it was last year. And some of that was sort of holdover from the pandemic. But a lot of it was just this sense that we have we are in this moment. It's a decisive decade. Special presidential envoy for climate, John Kerry, talks about that all the time. This is a yep. decisive decade, and it's true for climate. It's also true for pollution. And it's also true for biodiversity loss. So uh, we are working really hard here at the State Department to um, find as many ways as we can to collaborate with as many other countries to solve these challenges. Yeah, I mean, you, as you, you had an extremely busy uh, 2022. Um, coming up, you have the, uh, in a couple of weeks, you have the UN uh, Intergovernmental Conference on uh, Marine Biodiversity in Areas Beyond National Jurisdiction. And then in uh, March, you have the 2023 Water Conference. Uh, where else can we uh, potentially see you, uh, listen to you? Meet you at, at some point. Talk about the rest of the year. Any other things that are that are on the radar that are important you want to mention? Please have the floor. Sure. Uh, this is well, there's important. so many things. Um, as you said, I thought last year was busy, and then we started this year, and I started to look out at my schedule um, starting this month, and it, <laughs> it's busy again. But that's all right. It's it's good busy. Um, we are doing this negotiation at the UN on the areas beyond national jurisdiction. That's the high seas. We talked about that before. Right, right. Hope that's been going on for 15 years. And if um if I have anything to say about it, we are going to finish that up. And I hope that you'll hear a lot about that when it happens because it is about a global commons. It's about the part of the planet that belongs to so many people and we we need to conserve it. Um, so there's that plus um the UN is hosting a major conference on water and water security, increasingly either because of droughts or extreme inundation and floods. The world is really challenged when it comes to water, and we're going to take a look at that and how to have better systems in place and how to deconflict as much as we can and prepare for the water challenges that we see ahead um, globally, because the water doesn't know where the border is. Only, you know, we humans create those borders. But beyond that, we have a, another two more sessions of our negotiations on global plastic agreement. Mm -hmm. We're also hopeful that this year we'll make some progress towards conserving more of the Antarctic. Uh, there's a treaty mm -hmm. system that um, 26, 27 countries um, work together to conserve the Antarctic, which is belongs again it's not it's not a country of its own it's governed mm -hmm. by these other by this group of countries and we hope that we'll create in the years ahead hope maybe sooner um marine protected areas there's one big one in the arctic now we'd like to create another one that would be a great way to get to 30 by 30 there's an annual convention about uh that that um where we get together and talk about how to govern the arctic and we're hoping that Later this year, maybe next, we can get agreement to create this new protected areas in the Arctic. That would be fantastic. The UN General Assembly meeting is always a time when countries come together and talk about conservation issues. I'm sort of amazed at how much this work has taken over big UN meetings like that, mm. or the G7 meeting, or the G20 meeting, where there are huge um entire work streams that are all that are devoted to not just climate change but also biodiversity and ocean conservation and science so those are fantastic places where we again try to advance um the, these issues and then of course there's the climate conference of the parties at the end of the year which will be a, another big event um where we you know we'll take stock of how are we doing after the paris agreement this is the first of the um, meetings where we um, are not so much thinking about what's ahead, but how did we do? And right. that'll be a really important inflection point. Um, and these new agreements are interesting. They are not um, like the Paris Agreement is not uh, one where we um, have a tribunal and we uh, basically sue each other. We use 
national action plans that are transparent and data and reporting that anyone can have access to um, to see whether countries are actually meeting uh, the goals that they set out and there are, um, there are ways to check the work and make sure that they're reporting it accurately. So the, again, that data and transparency that we now have gives greater accountability in some ways than ever before to hold other countries and ourselves to the promises that we make. So it's a it's an exciting year. And um, I think, you know, we'll also start to make progress on that 30 by 30 objective because we don't have a whole 10 years. We only have seven to go and we have yeah. to get there. And we're um, we have about 13 percent of the land and 20 or more percent of the ocean to go. Um, to get to 30 by 30. So hopefully we'll start to make progress on actually putting aside more areas for protection, not just the Antarctic, but um, lots of places. Well, it's going to be a busy seven years, but I'm, I'm glad you're there doing it. And it's it's just a fascinating uh, journey that you've been on there. And I just really, really appreciate you sharing all of this with us. And it, it's just been so interesting listening to uh, to this journey and really wishing you the best. Um, uh, again, you. for for everybody that's going to be listening to this particular episode of the show uh, on the various podcast networks or watching on our YouTube channel, again, you've been listening to Monica Medina, Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of Oceans and International Environmental and Scientific Affairs, United States Department of State. Also, Special Envoy for Biodiversity and Water Resources. Um, Secretary Medina, I want to thank you again so much for taking the time out of your schedule to come talk to us and educate us for a little while. Obviously, thank you for your long service to the United States. And as we like to say on our show here, uh, thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow for everybody via what you do. Really amazing. Story. So kind. Thank you for having me and letting me talk about the work that we do. I hope everyone um uh, you know, thinks about it when they go outside this weekend, um, thinks about how, what a wonderful place we have, what a wonderful home we have here on earth. And I always like to say we have to tend our garden. This is really, this is the work we do and we have to always do it. It will never um, do itself, do it itself. So thank you again for giving me a chance to talk about what we do. And I hope it's inspired others to take action too. Most absolutely. Great seeing you. Thank you.